one of the things I was, <laughs> it's right here on the page. I was going to say that um, Angela has a particular kind of humor, um, surviving hum survival humor, uh, that she's really developed and that folks had to develop it from at that time. But sort of as another way of dealing, another kind of intensity, that intensity of, of Angela's humor, there's another kind of intensity, and that's Carolyn Rogers' intensity. Uh, I kind of, this may be too big a word for her, but I kind of think of, of, of Carolyn Rogers' poetry as metaphysical poetry. Uh, and that has, a long, that has a long historical precedence and it begins like with um, uh, Phyllis Wheatley. We have, in the American tra tradition, you have um, uh, Emily Dickinson. In the black Southern tradition, you have James Weldon Johnson in his compositions in the black sermon tradition where you know, sermons are chanted like a, like a ritual. Rogers comes along in that line, but at just that point, she turns everything upside down. She turns everything upside down in the way that in her later works, her, her, her works are more devotional. Her poetic language is in the experience of the congregation, sometimes that grum, grumbled amen, rather than what the preacher is handing down. Well, spirituality is at the root of, um, of all art. Um, but she, have, she had, at the time of the movement, a rejection of Christianity because it was exploitative. But she had some folks who did not reject Christianity. They hung in there because they knew of, the, um, of what it meant to the people um, coming from Africa. Now, I think um, she might get on me for this. But I, <laughs> but I, think, I, think, I think Carolyn Rogers is one of those voices that really survived in the art as well as in her uh, retention of the devotion, uh, devotionalism that, that, the, that, that was brought over from Africa. Carolyn? Yes. Thank you. Okay. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I don't think I can add much more. She did a completely <laughs> thorough job. <laughs> <laughs> I sat there and I thought, well, I sat for four months from May to now not knowing exactly what to say and how to say it, and I read so many books and I studied and I thought and we had meetings and we talked, and I thought, hmm, I said, I, all of that and still there's more, <laughs> and she brought the more, you know. Uh, I was a member of Obasi. I went to the first meeting. Uh, I lived right next door to Ann Smith and Duke McNeil at the time they were married, uh, and they were founders of Obasi, and they told me simply that um, something big was happening, that there was gonna be a meeting, and that uh, if you write poetry or sing, and at that time, I thought I was going to be another Odetta. I don't know how many of you know who Odetta <laughs> was, but uh, Odetta had a short natural, and she, um, she played the guitar and she sang folk songs. And I thought that was my calling. I was singing in what was in coffee houses of uh, uh, Chicago. Uh, and uh, I was writing my own lyrics, though, and I was rearranging music. But I thought I'd go and find out. And, and I also wrote poetry on the side, which I tossed into a closet or read to my close friends, never thinking of myself as a writer or poet in any way at all. I never imagined that even a poem would be anything more than just something that I would you know, write and then just toss aside and keep and harbor. Um, so I went to the meeting and it was, um, I think it was at Northeastern, um, the, the, uh, the, they now call it the City of Inner City Studies on um, 30, 39th Street, I think that's where the first meeting was. And the people were screaming and shouting and I mean it was just, unbelievable. And for some reason, I, I, I became fired up. I mean, uh, as you will see when I, when I read this, um, this, this um, essay that I wrote, The Way We Were, to I Knew I've Been Changed, I wasn't that kind of a person. But I became interested, and I decided that I would become a part of this movement and spend my life to a certain extent. I've never been sorry that I went to that first meeting, that I decided I would cross over and become someone very different from whom I did, who I did, thought that I was going to become, you know? So this first essay is called 
the way we were, and it, it talks about um, the fact that I know I've been changed. I was living in a bougie apartment right underneath Arna Bonton, a distinguished black author from the Harlem Renaissance I had never even heard of. I would ride the elevator in the mornings on my way to work. I was working at that time at the YMCA with this distinguished, nutmeg, handsome, gray-haired man and wonder who he was. Was he somebody? Can you imagine? <laughs> One morning, a friend from work came to give me a ride and just happened to recognize Arna Bonton's name on the apartment door roster. On the way to work, my ignorance was turned into awe and awareness as I was given a lecture about this man who was a part of my African-American literary heritage. How many of you know who Arna Bonton was? He was a writer in the Harlem Renaissance. He, at that time, was working uh, on his PhD at the University of Chicago, and I was living right there on 49th in Dorchester. And, <laughs> and he was living, I was in apartment 2E, and I could hear him, he was in apartment 3E. And I <laughs> never knew who he was. It was the most amazing thing. At that time, as I said, I was Odetta. <laughs> <laughs> And I was also working with a group of high school dropouts on the near north side of Chicago. It was during the late 60s and the early 70s when they told me the revolution was coming. Black people, they said, were organizing for a revolution against the unjust forces that still oppressed and enslaved our people and had for the last 400 years or more. Will you answer the call, they asked me. No, I will not, I had answered at first. With my page boy straight hair, my new expensive suits for my first nine to five job, and my newly found away from home freedom. I was not angry enough at anybody or anything to say yes. Oh, I had read Baldwin and Brooks, Wright and Hughes, and yes, I had applauded long and honestly, arduously through the thunderous speeches of Martin and especially Malcolm X. I had attended the Northern Sympathy Gatherings for SCLC and SNCC, that Southern Christian Leadership Conference and Student Nonviolent, not coordinating con uh, committee, those were students. And I had formulated the popular, acceptable, and informed opinions about everything that was being debated at the time. Black power, integration, the black Muslims, the Republic of New Africa, should we build a new Africa, should we move to back to Africa, natural hairdos, uh, reparations, replacing slave names with African names, the role of Christianity in our oppressed lives. The list was long, and this is only a partial list. I had been a part of many groups in high school and college where those were the only topics that seemed worth talking about. I had been in groups where for hours we, as young Negroes, we still called ourselves that, debated on nothing but to, what to call ourselves. Were we going to be Africans? Were we going to be African Americans? Were we going to be blacks? Were we going to be Afro-Americans? Were we going to remain Negro still? Even the term colored people had its place and platform. I was not angry. I was having just too much fun being young and looking for life still. Then I went to a meeting. I was casually invited to a newly formed group of artists. I wrote poetry secretly, but since I played the guitar, I wrote lyrics and music and sang folk songs openly in the coffee houses of Chicago, I was classified as an artist of would-be sorts. The meeting was an idea about to happen. Black, colored, Negro, Afro-American, whatever your persuasion was for calling names, we were all there discussing artistic points of views which were supposed to be of primary interest to our ethnic group only. For the first time in my life, I heard about artistic responsibility accountability, and commitment to something other than myself. Words like relevant, unity, genocide, racism, oppression, positive and negative images popped up again and again, and a new way of thinking, being, and writing began to present itself to me. No longer, I was told, was I to write meaningless poetry for irrelevant reasons. That meant that the poems that I had written about trees and stars were to be tossed away. Art by black people was for black people, and it was to be as useful as shoes or coats, if possible. Indispensable to the body, spirit, and soul. If I could not write that way, I would be wasting words like precious time, food, or money. People needed the right black words, 
And once I was correctly informed, I had an obligation to provide those words. This time, the people who outlined the need, the plight, the cause, were people who affected me in the heart and the mind. I made the decision. It was like crossing a wide stream of water, all silver, going someplace from both sides. I could not see the beginning or the ends of. And um, one of the things that interested me to continue was the quote that you read that um, Eliz uh, Elizabeth Alexander uh, put in her, uh, in her writings, that her fantasy was to put many of the writers from this particular era on a stage and to talk about those important years. So what I did was I um, distilled five questions out of the quote. Um, who was aligned with who? What were the goals that might now be understood or shared as shared, even if the means differed? Who was saying what? Uh, who were we saying it to? What were our aims? How can we face today's challenges? I'm not sure I can answer that last one at all. I don't know how to do that. But someone younger may come behind me and do that. But um, I decided I would try and deal with some of that. Because the Johnson Publishing Company was located in Chicago, and Ebony and Jet and Negro Digest were Johnson publications, which American artists and entertainers in uh, Chicago came to, uh, it, it, it seemed as if it was the focal point. I noticed that when I was a member of um, Obasi Workshop, as, and I was also a member of the Gwendolyn Brooks Workshop, which was a more elite workshop, only certain ones of us, for some reason or another, I don't know how she picked us, but most of the people who were in Gwendolyn Brooks Workshop were in Obasi, but not all of the people who were in Obasi were in Gwendolyn Brooks's workshop. There were maybe about seven or eight of us. People like James Baldwin, um, Margaret Walker, they would come to town, uh, Conrad Kent Rivers, uh, John O'Killens, of course, Baraka, all these people would come through and they would always end up at Gwendolyn Brooks' house. Consequently, there, it, came, it became like a meeting place and it was also a focal point. Well, you put the two together, Johnson Publishing Company and Gwendolyn and Brooks, and what do you have? You have a little uh, mecca, you might say, of where people can come and talk about ideas and the times and, and, and get to know each other. And I always felt as if, as, um, as, 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 as if I was accepting um, a mantle. Uh, um, I was accepting something uh, that was being passed down to me. Uh, it, 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 at first, it was like we were just fraternizing, we were fellowshipping, we were meeting and enjoying um, these famous people that you read about, like Baldwin. I mean, can you imagine meeting someone like James Baldwin in Gwendolyn and Brooks's home? It was quite overwhelming for a young person, but I soon realized that they were giving us something, something that I once said was very tangible. It was like breathing, like air, like, like food, like, like money. They wanted us to continue a struggle that had already begun, and we were supposed to pick up those, those, uh, those, uh, those mantles and run with them. So people from all over the world came to Chicago, and the question, who was aligned with, with, with whom? We were aligned with people from all over the world. People from Africa would come in, and they would come to Gwendolyn Brooks' house, simply because she was the Pulitzer Prize winner. She'd won, she had won, and she was a voice. She spoke for oppressed, for uh, her people. And um, they respected that. They loved her. She was down to earth. She was not easy. Uh, she was not difficult to get to know. She was not hard to get along with at all. You know, she made herself available to people. So she set up certain alliances uh, automatically. What were the goals? Now, these are more important. We wanted to continue the telling of the African-American story in the world. We hoped to establish a black aesthetic and I don't yet know what that is, but we, t we worked at it for hours. We spent hours screaming and yelling and talking about if you write a poem about tr a tree, is it black? I mean, the people would come in and they would want to kill Hoyt. They'd want to kill us if we didn't uh, say that the poem that they had written was beautiful, was black, simply because they had a black skin. Well, we said a black aesthetic does not allow that. And we switched and said maybe it did because there was something inherently in the language and in this perspective that was black. But we never could define exactly what it was, you see. So we talked about it, we talked about it, we wrote about it. I wrote an essay which talked about how we signify and how some of our poems 
look like we're signifying. They do how we confront each other, how we rap, how we run it down, uh, and how um, we have a poem that sort of looks like a gospel hymn or a blues um, song. We have all of that. We do have it. But I'm not sure that at the end of all of that, that we have what is a black aesthetic. But then again, I think that in some instances, you can see something. So suffice to say that it's still going on. We're still working at it. We do have something that we can see sometimes that is quite tangible. When you look at a blues poem written, say, for a, like Sterling Brown writes, you can see the blues. I mean, it screams at you. You can see the jazz. You, you know, you can see sometimes the rhythm not just the rhythm, but the language. Not just the language, but a spirit that leaps out of not the gospel, uh, Owen Dotson uh, poems that he wrote. You could see these things and you can get a sense of what we were attempting to do. We may have been uh, reaching for stars, you know, but we thought that it was the kind of thing that we should do because we were tired of white critics criticizing our work and criticizing it from a standard that we could not, in most instances, even hope to adhere to. We didn't want to. We didn't want to be compared to Hemingway sometimes. We didn't want to be compared to Wordsworth. We didn't want to have to deal with who Shakespeare was in our writings. We wanted to be who we were, you see. And we felt that we had that right as a people. So one of the things that we were trying to do, not that we negated any of them, not that we said that they weren't great writers, but we felt that we should have a specific voice, a specific way of speaking, and, 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 and presenting our, our story, it was uniquely ours. And in some instances, I feel we did succeed, but I'm not sure that we did establish a black state. I think it's an ongoing thing. All right, um, we also hope to, I didn't want to forget this too, I see I wrote it down, that's why it's good to have notes. We hope to establish critics. Um, I touched on that just a little, but um, Hoyt would just go crazy when he'd get these cr different critics' um, assessments of our works. And um, one of the things that we did in Obasi was to train people, and I know I learned to review books, and I learned the hard way. Hard knocks, you, you, uh, you knock somebody in the black community without understanding what they're saying, and you make enemies. You don't always say what's positive, but you do try and find out what each black person is saying. We learn to critique each other's works without being negative necessarily, you, you understand. We learned that there is a standard that we, ha that, that we could adhere to, and we learned to be our own critics. That's very important. That's very important. We also learned to publish our own works. That's major. When I started out, um, I, I, I was going to look for a publisher, and Gwilyn Brooks said to me, why don't you publish it yourself? Well, that was always looked down on. You know, you publish your own work. Who does that, you know? Um, but she said, do it yourself. The, uh, it, it makes a big difference. You call all the shots from start to finish. You know, you don't have to worry about an editor or uh, looking at it or a publishing house saying, this is too, quote, black. This is too uh, militant. Uh, people won't like it. It's not the popular subject of the time. It's not quite right. All those things go down the drain when you do your own. And so she said, why don't you publish your own little, little and she went over the, the manuscript with me and wrote notes on each poem. And at the end, Hoyt wrote an uh, introduction, and I published it, and I was amazed at what can happen when you do that. Um, what did happen was that white people accepted the work as a published work. I actually got reviewed in uh, magazines like Chicago Magazine, uh, Nation Magazine, which is a large magazine which still exists, wrote and asked me to publish a, the, for a poem. The amazing things happen when you take the responsibility of your own life and you, and you decide, I'm going to do it, my, not necessarily my way, but this way, you know, a way that I can believe in a little bit more. So I went on from there to publish Songs of a Blackbird, and um, uh, then I went to Doubleday, which was uh, another story altogether, not an easy thing to, uh, to, uh, to talk about because um, wasn't exactly a pleasant experience, but it was a good experience. It was a learning experience. And the only reason I ever got to Doubleday was because a black a writer down at the Phyllis Wheatley Conference in Mississippi saw two little books of poetry, Paper Soul and Songs of a Blackbird. And because she got hired at a white publishing house in New York, and at that time they were hiring 
one black editor, and that one black editor said, oh, hey, I've seen these two little black books of poetry. I think maybe we could publish you another way, another beginning, you see. So we tried to establish our own critics. We tried to publish our own work so that we could control our own voice. And uh, this is something that I would say to Elizabeth. We did, in many instances, succeed in that. I'll go on to the third one. Um, who uh, was saying what um, and to who were we speaking? We were speaking to the world. We were trying to, um, to um, break down the barriers between um, us and the Africans. We wanted to, um, in a sense, go back to Africa and then come back to the United mm -hmm. States. We wanted to, uh, to be Africans while we were African Americans. We wanted to reclaim that. Uh, that, that heritage. So we were speaking not only to the people in the United States about who we were and what we wanted to be and what we wanted to do. We were going out all over the world. In particular, we went to back to Africa to find roots, to find support, to find the heart, the soul of who we were. So I think that uh, that question was answered. And I think you would see that in the works, that the people began to embrace their heritage more and to write about that heritage. The fourth one, um, what was our aims? Uh, I've spoken about that. And how can we face today's challenges? I don't know the answer to that one. <laughs> I honestly don't know. I, I, I look at the challenges today, and sometimes I think, have we moved anywhere? I, I mean, have we, have we moved at all? It's 2007, and uh, I was pointing out to uh, um, Ed Robeson that I have two books. One is called Giant, um, Giant Steps. This was published in... 2000, this is uh, the New Young Black Writers with Elizabeth Alexander's in here and Kevin Young. And I have this book, which I found at, the, uh, at a, um, uh, a, a, bo a book fair. Excuse me, Giant Talk was published in 1975. And these are both capitalizing on the thing giants. You'd be hard pressed to find a difference in some of the voices that, that are speaking, into the writers. The writers are still talking us about the good things, the gospel, jazz, uh, about um, the, uh, a love for our people and ourselves, but the problems that we face are still there with our children, with school, with uh, civil rights, if you want to use that term. I mean, uh, you can't really um, say that we've moved, yet you can't say that we've stood still. So um, I, I, I don't know what lessons. I'll leave that for somebody else. <laughs> I'm sure he can tackle it better than I can, Sally. Um, and in closing, um, I'd like to read um, a poem that I wrote called Affirmation. Um, it kind of is a little bit of a, a manifesto for me. Um, and it's a broadside. And um, it will be available back there. And I wrote it because I just felt that um, I wanted to write a poem um, I think Ed asked me more than once, who inspired me? And Gwendolyn Brooks, of course, inspired me. I loved to sit in her home, and I loved to read her poems. And I really, I guess the best thing about it was I truly enjoyed her work, and I truly appreciated it. But the other woman that I truly loved was Margaret Walker. And she truly inspired me with For My People. And when I read For My People, all I knew was that I wanted to write a poem like that. I wanted to write one, like, and I knew I couldn't. But I thought this is my attempt when I wrote Affirmation to write a poem like for my people. Uh, it doesn't address all of my people, but it does address some of us. I gave this world a song. The sounds of my life, my voice, my weeping, my laughter. I gave this world my strength. I drenched it in my tears so that it grew crops of prosperity. I oiled its wheels with the rumbling resonance of my existence. In the wind and in the bluesy blue flame of fires, I can see and I can hear the stories of my passages in time. I am so many women you cannot rightly name me. So many spirits of our dead rest in my breast, I cannot know myself as one woman either. I died in the heat of a Harlem or Detroit or South African or Chicago summer night, my throat gruff stuffed with the dreams of all my kind around me. But when I died, I had planted fire seeds in the children all around me. Each time breath left a body, 
a fire burning inside to survive ran rampant in my people's souls. Those breaths became the very air breathed in the poverty that screamed nothing and nobody. Garbage of old used lives, the stench of putrefied dreams, all in the streets with the sweet greenery of youth. A scrawny, stubborn tree or bush, or a scrawny gang of boys and girls laughing and talking, their living full of themselves, stutters the eye and makes the unbelievers know the meaning of grace and mercy. A wind blows all the way up the Mississippi River from the south with the sweet scent of honeysuckle, lilac, or magnolia. It weaves in and out of the blue light, red night nights, red light nights, in and out of the wine and whiskey avenues, and stumbles through the streets, hung up in the air where the red eyes and stubborn dreams live. Cardboard and stone altars to God, the storefront churches hug the soul's misery away. Tell the sad soul and spirit their survival secrets. Whisper sweet songs and the miracle veil stories of millions of Joshua's fit into battles of all the Jerichos of Daniel's in the lion's dens of Moses' bare feet before God and the burning bushes like the burning hearts. And ain't I a woman? Winnie Mandela once cried out in a lonely year on a lonely night, a lone spent life, as Nelson's, Nelson's imprisoned pulse became the drum beat from the prison roar of freedom's call. And ain't I a woman? Women have cried as they struggle to break the yoke of worldly evils. Yes, black spirit in the world moaned. Yes, it affirmed. If we can be the best of what we were, why our future will exist through the best efforts from our past, our newness will gain its momentum from the bone and marrow of oldness. Come then, Sojourner, come Harriet, come then Bethune, come Wheatley, come Zora. We will arise as one valiant, victorious dream, one triumph for one here, one triumph for one there, for one in life, from one in death, for millions of ones, an army of ones, marching all over the world, trampling out the sodden, miserable dreams of frustration and failure. We will do this. We will be this for our strength, our liberty, our lives. It has already begun. Yes, it has. It was, even in our crossing over. Yes, black spirit in the world moaned. Yes, black spirit in the world affirmed. Thank you. Thank you.